love him and we appreciate him. He always does a great job preaching God's word. And I'm really looking forward to tonight's lesson. Brother Sam, would you preach for us? Brother Tony, and to the elders, thanks for the invitation to be back with you. It's a joy to be here. I just want to say on the outset, I've got to get relaxed. I'm not a PowerPoint presenter. Uh, and then saying, why are you doing a PowerPoint lesson then? It's because the lesson that I'm dealing with, I want to kind of take my time to deal with it because I believe it's important. But I'm a preacher. And so tonight, instead of preaching to you, I'm going to teach you. And I hope you don't mind. Uh, I want to say that this year, one of my resolutions is that I'm not going to have a bad day. And guess what? It's July the 1st. And I want to testify and tell you that I haven't had a bad day this year. And I hope that you have not had a bad day. Tony, thank you all for planning these series of lessons. I love the family. And I want to share with this with you before we embark upon the lesson tonight, two things I want you to remember. And that is at this present time, the American family is in the worst condition that has been in in the history of our nation. With that said, what can we do? And lessons like that you've been having on Sunday evenings is a lesson that we need not only here, but throughout the world and throughout America. What can we do to strengthen our families, to make our marriages stronger? And particularly, I want to say in the African-American community, only 32% of our homes are headed by two parents. Only 32%. And they're projecting by the year 2030 that that may be 20%. If we're going to make our communities better, it starts with the families. So the American family is in the worst condition that has been in the history of this nation. And then the second thing I want you to remember, and that is the marriage rate. In 2022, the marriage rate hit its all-time low. It has never been as low as it is at this present time and our nation. And therefore, we need lessons on encouraging young people to get married and then lessons on how to stay married. And the lesson that's been assigned to be tonight is the ideal wife. And what I want to do is, is share with you, and I hopefully that I can get this to work. And my goal is to share with you some qualities from the Bible of an ideal wife. I don't want to share with you from a psychology book or a sociology book or the latest counseling book, but I want to share with you from the Bible, the greatest book ever written on the characteristics of the qualities of a good wife. And I want to say to the young men who are, who are single here, I want to share with you what you ought to be looking for and a wife that will stay with you. And I want to say to the women here that are married and the women that are here, these are the qualities that you need to encourage to manifest in your life. Nine years ago, my first wife, Rhonda, died. And after her death, I thought I would never, ever get married again. And I started praying to God. And, and seven years ago this month, God sent Diane to me. And as I was putting this lesson together, those, the attributes that I'm going to share with you, the qualities that I'm going to share with you, I saw all these qualities in Diane. That's the reason why it was easy for me to get down on my knees and say, will you please marry me? And so tonight, I'm going to share with you some qualities of an ideal wife, and I want to encourage you men to be looking, that are single, to be looking for women or for a wife with these qualities. And for the women that are here, strive to manifest these qualities in your life that you can keep your marriage being the greatest marriage in the world. So that's my goal. Now, I have two objectives to achieve this goal. The first objective is I wanna just start off by just sharing with you and promoting marriage. 
Marriage has gotten a bad rap. And what I want to do is just start off by promoting marriage. And then the second, I want to share with you from the book of Proverbs. So if you don't mind, you can have your copy of God's Word. Go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 31, because that's the text that we're going to use to share with you some qualities of an ideal wife, okay? So objective number one, marriage. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, every animal on earth had a mate, but God looked at man and said, it's not good for man to be alone. Thank you, God. God said it was not good for us to be alone, and God made man a helpmeet. And so God instituted marriage, and I'm here to tell you, marriage is magnificent. I want to say that, not just because my wife is here, I'm getting brownie points, but I've been married, this is a, with the two marriages together, 46 years. My first wife, we stayed together 38 years, and Diane, if I'm doing my math right, uh, this year we'll be celebrating seven years. So it'll be, we've almost married 39 years, Rhonda and I. But marriage is magnificent. And so if you have a good wife, if you have a good husband, you ought to praise God. You ought to give God thanks. Marriage is a wonderful institution. But it's sad that marriage's view, view has changed in America. 50 years ago, 50 years ago, students and people that were 16 years and 17 years of age, they just couldn't wait to turn 18, 19, or 20 to get married to get married, because marriage was a wonderful thing to, to embrace. And so people look forward to, they dreamed about one day getting married. But today, few young people are dreaming about marriage. When I was in high school, all I could think about was getting married. And at the age of 20, I proposed to my first wife. But how many young people today, 18 and 19 and 20, are uh, dreaming about getting married? Not very many. It used to be the average age at one time was 20 to get married. Today, it is 32 has become the common age. So if you're 28 and you're single, it used to be you were a spinster or an old maid, but not anymore because 32 is the new average age for the first marriage. Times have changed. 50 years ago, if you were single, you were labeled because normal people got married. And so singlehood had a bad, negative view of by many in America. But it has changed. Now singlehood has a glowing perspective and marriage is deemed as being negative because the view of marriage has changed so much in America. And so what can we do? What can we do to improve our marriages? It starts with identifying the qualities of an ideal husband and the qualities of an ideal wife. And tonight, I want to deal with the latter one. What are the qualities of an ideal wife? so that we can strengthen our marriages, that we can make America on a better nation, that we can save our family that's in a state of crisis, that we can build our homes where they not only have one parent, they have two parents. Just 48 years ago, 48 years ago, 93% of American homes had two parents in them. 42 years ago, Today, it is 68% overall, and then 32% in the African-American community. What can we do to change this? The way we change it is by coming up and teaching, teaching lessons like this on ideal marriage and ideal husband. And so, God said it's not good for man to be alone. We need, it's in, it's in, if you desire to get married, it's wonderful to have someone to share your life with. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not happy just because I'm married to a sweet lady like Diane. I'm thankful that God saw that it was not good for men to be alone. 
and God fixed it where we can have someone to share our lives with. So that's a promotion to encourage people want to get married. There's nothing wrong with marriage. It is not a prison institution. Marriage is a wonderful institution designed by God for the good of man. Now, what are the qualities? What are the qualities of an ideal wife? What are the qualities that a man ought to be looking for? What are the qualities that a woman ought to be striving to have manifest in her life? Again, as I said, the book of Proverbs, in my opinion, is the best book in the Bible on the checklist of the qualities of an ideal woman. I know many of you have read the chapter, you're familiar with it, but I want us to look at it now tonight and kind of pinpoint some qualities that I believe that are deemed essential to being a woman, to be that ideal wife, to being a woman, to be the ideal Christian lady that God wants her to be. Proverbs 31 was penned by King Lemuel. What do we know about this king? We don't know much about him. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about him. But it's speculated that two things about who he possibly could be. Some believe that he was a Gentile king and he married a Jewish woman. That's speculated by some. Some believe, and perhaps even true, that this is none other than Solomon himself. The point is, we don't know. So who was King Lemuel? We don't know. In my opinion, for what it's worth, I believe it was Solomon. But I can't prove it, and I can't disprove it. But so this chapter was penned by King Lemuel, okay? Now, look at the first nine verses. In the first nine verses of this chapter, the king is told three things, two things to avoid and one thing to pursue. Two things to avoid. And who is talking to him? His mother. His mother is sharing with him, son, here are the things you ought to look for, uh, two things you ought to avoid, and here's one thing that you ought to pursue. What's the first thing you ought to avoid? Look at verses 2 and 3. Avoid bad women. Avoid bad women. You know, I have raised three boys. My job as a father was to teach them, avoid bad women. Why, in other words, what he's saying, don't let lust lead you. Learn at a young age to control your sexual urges. Learn to control your sexual desires that when you go into marriage, you can also control them, that your marriage don't end because of infidelity. So the first thing, son, if you're going to be a good husband, learn to control your lustful desires. Avoid bad women. Then he says, in that, reading into it, we need to remember what happened to Samson. Samson was one of God's judges. Would you remember what happened to him by a bad woman? Remember King Ahab, a good king, but he married a woman that was a bad woman, Jezebel. And he became the worst king that Israel ever had. So the first thing he says, avoid bad women. Then he says the second thing, avoid strong drink. Avoid alcohol. In verses 4 through 7, son, she's saying, son, avoid bad women, but also don't engage in alcoholic drinks. And then later on, King Solomon in Proverbs 23, verse 29 through 31, talk about the danger of alcohol. Why every man, why every woman, why every person ought to avoid alcohol. Who has woes? Who has sorrow? He that looks upon a drink when it is, when it is red, avoid alcohol. If you want to keep your marriage together, avoid alcoholic beverages. Don't drink. Those are the two things she said to her son. 
to avoid. But then she said in verses 8 and 9, son, if you're going to be a good king, rule rightly with compassion. Notice, rule justly and be a king of compassion. And if you know anything about Solomon in his first year or so as a king, he manifests both of these qualities, even when his first case, as we'll talk about with the, the situation with the two women, righteously with compassion. And so, King Lemuel, given no advice by his mother, but look at verse 10. In verse 10, we're given what is called an acrostic poem. An acrostic poem means that the 22 verses of the Hebrew alphabets are used to bring out some points. And so, King Lemuel, he uses uh, uh, the, the, the Hebrew alphabets. And each of those, and that's, if you look at it, you'll notice there are 22 verses. And there's 22 alphabets in the Hebrew language. And each one of those is designated to give a point. And, and so, in the next 22 verses, King Lemuel's mother utters what I call the ABCs of an ideal wife. Now, what are the ABCs? What I want to do now is share with you, if time permits, quickly, 10 qualities of the ideal wife from Proverbs. Now, the help, to help me to manifest and to display these, I like to use acronyms. And so here are my acronyms, P, T, S, I, C. P, T, S, I, C, 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 T, R, G. Now, those are letters that stand for the points. And so, hopefully, you remember one or two of these. But here are 10 qualities of the ideal woman. And I'm challenging every single female in here to write these down and strive to emulate them. And to every mother, to every woman in this audience to become knowledgeable of these 10 qualities and assess and see if you're measuring up to what King Lemuel's mother told him, that here are the qualities of an ideal wife. I saw these qualities in Diane, and I'm thankful that God put her in my life. The first one, the P. Verse 10, she's priceless. She's priceless. She's rare. An ideal wife, an ideal woman, she's rare. She's not on every corner. She's not everywhere. Not every lady will fit into this. But that's something that every Christian ought to strive to be. And notice what the Bible says. A virtuous woman. A virtuous woman is a priceless woman. What's a virtuous woman? She's honorable. She's upright. She's a lady that strives to live the best life that she possibly can. She's the epitome She's the epitome of what a woman or a wife should be. She's priceless. Her price is far above a ruby. She's more valuable. If you can find a good wife, she's worth more than all the money in the world. You couldn't give me. No one can give me $300 trillion to replace Diane. That's how valuable she is to me. I'd rather have her than all the money in the world. And when a man finds a woman that is priceless, there's no amount of money in the world that can replace her. And so, notice, a good woman, ideal woman, she says to her son, she's priceless, son. That means you got to look for her. And Solomon says, who can find a, such a woman? She's, she's not, you've got to look for her. You've got to pray for her. And I spent months, I spent years praying, God, please send me 
Send me in that space of time after Rhonda's death. And before Rhonda's death, I spent years praying because I started thinking about getting married when I was 15. And at 20, I was married. But I prayed. I prayed, God, send me the right woman. Send me the right person. And that's what it's talking about here. Oh, ideal wife is priceless and that means you're going to have to invest some time finding her she's out there but remember she's rare but when you find her her price is far above rubies in proverb 18 verse 22 solomon says who can find a wife notice finds a what a good thing when you got a good wife let me tell you you can sleep at night when you got a good wife, you can come home from work and there's peace. When you've got a good wife, life is enjoyable and life is happy. I'm going to share with you in just a moment what you have if you don't have a good wife. But a wife that is good, that fits the qualities that God wants, she's priceless. Number two, not only is she P, she's T. She's trustable. You see, when you can't trust your wife, then you don't have a marriage. When there's jealousy and when there's mistrust in a marriage, whether it be on the part of the woman or the man, you don't have much of a marriage. What makes a marriage great? One of the best qualities, yes, is love. But if you can love someone, but if there's jealousy in your marriage, let me tell you, you don't sleep good at night. You don't work well at from home. But when you have trust in a marriage, you've got gold. And that's why she says to her son, not only she's price, priceless, she's trustable. And when you can trust your spouse, when you can trust your spouse and you know that she means you well, that he means you well, I'm going to tell you, that's nothing more valuable than this ingredient here. She's trustworthy. She's honest. She's a person of profound integrity. She understands the true meaning of love. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus says, the true meaning of love is when you love someone with all your heart, soul, and mind. And when you've got a woman when you have a wife that loves you with all of her heart, soul, and mind, man, you have something great. And you ought to treasure that. You ought to be thankful to God. If you have a wife that loves you this way, you ought to be thanking God every day. You ought to be praising God. Thank you, God. Because if you have a wife that you can't trust, then you know what agony is all about. You know what misery is. It's all about no one has to tell you what misery is like. You're living in misery. But when you have someone you trust, I'm telling you, you have something more valuable than anything in the world. In her life, because she loves you with all her heart, soul, and mind, you are her top priority. Did you hear what I just said? That means you come before her mother. And when a woman puts you before a mother, they're saying something. You come before her best girlfriends. You are it. That's what it means, trustable. She loves you so much that she puts you even before herself. All of that is wrapped up in being trustable. Proverbs 12 and verse 4, an excellent wife. That was read just a few moments ago. It's the crown of her husband. She lives to make her husband look good. He's a crown. She lives to make her husband look good. That's what is implied and taught by she's the crown of her husband. She lives with the motive of pleasing her husband. Thank God for women like that. Number three, she's selfless. She's selfless. When she said, I do, guess what? She died to herself. Notice what the Bible says in verse 12 about the ideal wife, the ideal woman. 
He receives good from her all the days of her life because she wakes up thinking about pleasing him. She goes to sleep thinking about pleasing him. All the days of her life is consumed with what can I do to let this man know he's loved? What can I do to let this man know he's, he's appreciated? That's the ideal wife. It ought to be the ideal husband, too, but we're not dealing with that tonight. The ideal wife, she lives. You say, well, Brother Jones, they don't make women like that anymore. That's why our homes are in the condition that they're in. That's why the marriage rate. I'm thankful that I saw in my grandmother, Naomi, this kind of relationship. My grandmom and granddad stayed married together for 66 years. I'm thankful that I saw that in my parents. And we need to bring this back where a wife is not about her, the husband is not about him. It's about the spouse. You center your life on making the spouse happy. Everything's going to be all right. Look in Proverbs 14, verse 1. The wise woman, the ideal wife, she builds a house up. But the foolish woman does everything she can to tear it down. That selfish woman is not about her. She's at building her home up. She's at building her husband up. Proverbs 21, verse 9. Listen to what the Bible says. Better to dwell in a corner of a house tomb than in a house shared by a contentious woman. When I was at Mississippi State University studying, Jerry Clower used to come there all the time. And I remember one joke he used to tell all the time. And every time I hear that joke, I think about a man in an unhappy marriage or a woman in an unhappy marriage. It's about a man who was out coon hunting. And he got up in a tree with a coon. And his buddy was down there and he said, just shoot up. He said, well, I can't. I hit you or hit I hit Mr. Coon. He said, one of us needs some relief. Well, in a bad marriage, sometimes that's the way it's seen. Just shoot. One of us needs some relief. And that's what he's saying, Solomon's saying here. A bad marriage that a man would rather be on the housetop with a blizzard. Why is that man sitting on the roof? You don't know what he's dealing with downstairs, so he'd rather stay on the house. That's what he's saying there. But when you have a woman who is not a contentious woman, she's not self-centered, then you've got peace. Listen to what he says in, in Proverbs 19, verse 13. A nagging wife is like a dripping fountain. It just aggravates you. And again, that's why you'd rather be on the rooftop. But if you've got a good wife that is understanding, that's compassionate, you are a blessed man and a selfless woman. She's not about nagging about what she's not getting because she's not concerned about what she's not getting because when her man is happy, she's happy. And it ought to be the same with the husband. That is not nagging. It's not being self-centered about what you're not getting in the marriage. It's what you ought to be putting in the marriage. That's the forethought. And when you've got two people in a marriage like that, you're going to have a great marriage. But when you've got someone who is selfish, then you've got a marriage that's miserable. Number four, she's industrious. She's industrious, and I know I've got to speed up. She's industrious. She's a hard worker. And those verses talk about how she does, she's willing to work for the good of her family. She's willing to work for the good of her husband. She wants her family to be comfortable. And so she does all of this, verse 13, willingly. You don't have to beg her. You don't have to force her. She willingly gets up early in the morning. She willingly stays up late at night because that's the good. When you love someone, when you love your husband, and when you love your family, there are things and sacrifices you'll make that some women would say, I wouldn't do those things. Well, Lemion's mother says, an ideal wife is a woman who's willing to make sacrifices for the good of her husband. 
for the good of her children. And so she works. Verse 14, there's no limit to what she'll do. She's not concerned what people in the community will say about her. She's a hard worker. She gets up before, verse 15, before the roosters. She's not afraid to get dirty. Yes, she's sophisticated, but she'll get down and she'll work hard. She has polished nails, but she has calloused hands. This is the ideal woman, according to the ideal wife, according to Lemuel's mother. And then, verse 18 and 27, she'll work well into the night. And so she's industrious. Well, let's very quickly go on. She's compassionate. Not only she's industrial, but she's compassionate. She cares not only for her family, but she looks out into the community. And when she sees people in need, she's moved with compassion. She's a caring, she's a caring wife. She's not like the rich farmer in Luke chapter 12. All he could think about was, man, I need to tear down these little bonds and build greater ones that I can store all my goods and just have so much more. She's not like that. She's not centered around herself. She looks out rather than looking in. When I think of this compassionate woman, I think of Luke 10, the Good Samaritan. She doesn't pass by on the other side like the Levite and like the priest, but like that Samaritan. She goes and she sees someone in needs in need, and she goes into a pocket. She helps the homeless. She helps the needy because she's a compassionate. That's the ideal wife. That's the kind of lady that you want to marry. That's the kind of wife that you want to take home to mom. That's the kind of lady you ought to strive to be known in the community as a compassionate, caring woman and wife. Number six, I say she's, cla she's classy. She's classy because she's modest in her appearance. And we read uh, verse 22 and verse number 23, it talks about she's as beautiful outwardly as she is inwardly. That's why she's classy. She's beautiful outside, but more importantly, she's beautiful inside. That's what <laughs> Lemuel mother tells him. She's a classy woman because she's modest. She's not trying to dress to be attractive to other men. She dresses to be appealing to her husband. She's beautiful in and out. And she's always concerned about her appearance and his eyes and not the eyes of other men. She is a classy woman. And thus, she is well thought of by others. And others say she's a classy lady. That's where we get the old saying, behind every great man is a great woman. When you've got a classy woman, you've got something special because she takes care of herself, not for the benefit of others, because she wants to be appealing and attractive to her husband. Number seven, number seven she's full of confidence. And you read verse number 25, she believes in herself. She believes in herself. She has good self-esteem. And so that motivates her that where she can work and focus on others because she feels good about herself. She realizes God has blessed her. And therefore, she doesn't go through life thinking about what she wants and what she needs because she realizes she's blessed and so she has confidence in herself. She feels good about herself, and so she's dead to herself. And because she's dead to herself, she now focuses on others. You see, people who can't focus on others are not dead to self. And when you're not dead to self, you're going to find yourself miserable because you can never be pleased by trying to please yourself. You can only be pleased by serving God and serving others. And when you find that in life, you're going to find true happiness. 
I hope you understood what I just said. True happiness comes in life when you serve God and you serve your fellow man, and then you're concerned about yourself. But when you put yourself up there as number one, you're not going to be happy because you can't make yourself happy. What makes you happy is God will give you peace when you make him first in your life, and she understands that. She has confidence. In Proverbs chapter 11, look at verse 22. And Solomon says, a beautiful woman without discretion, without common sense, without good sense, is like a hoe with a ring, gold ring in his nose. Now, what are you saying, Solomon? A woman who is beautiful but doesn't display good sense, it makes, is as ugly as a hog with a gold ring in his nose. Now, what good is a gold ring in a hog nose? They don't go together. And that's what he's saying about a woman who is beautiful and doesn't use good common sense. And that's why she has good common sense. She has confidence in herself. Very quickly, number eight, she's a teacher. Look at verse 26. She teaches with her mouth. Listen to her words. She knows just what to say to those people who are discouraged. She knows what to say to people who are going through things. She's able to teach because she's a teacher, not only with her actions, but she's a teacher with her mouth. She able to, she's able to control the tongue because she's cautious about how she says what she says. She is a teacher. She's a living epistle, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 2. As we are coming to this close, look in Proverbs 16, verse 24. Pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. She understands that. So when someone is going through things in the home or in the community or in the church, this ideal wife knows how to use her words to heal a broken heart. She's a teacher, but not only she's a teacher, but she's respected. And that's what he says in verses 28 and 29 and 31. Respected means she's blessed. She's called that. And the community, everybody gives her praise. Everybody gives her praise. Her children calls her blessed. Her husband calls her blessed. The people in the community calls her blessed. And Romans 13 and verse number 7 says, we ought to give honor to whom honor is due. And an ideal woman, she's worthy of honor. That husband ought to be thankful. And he ought to show it in his action towards her that he has been given something blessed. The children, usually they know it. They thank God for the sweet mother that they have been given and a man with an ideal woman who's respected ought to consider himself blessed also. And so Lemuel's mother says, her children called her blessed. Her husband called her blessed. The people in the community, they look upon her and says, that goes a blessed woman. And finally, number 10, verse number 30, She's godly. This is kind of the belt that holds the other nine together. She's godly. But listen to what that verse says. Her excellent character is not something that's fleeting. It's not something she manifests for a short period of time and, and it fleets away. He says charm is deceitful. You see, there are some women that can give you a smile and they're just deceiving you, but not this woman. So charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. God has blessed some women with beauty, but because they abuse it in a matter of time, it escapes. But this woman's beauty is not just outside. Look at the latter part of verse number 30. And he says this, but what is more important than the outward beauty is a woman who fears the Lord, a woman who fears the Lord. 
Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so, King Lemuel, mother, uttered these qualities. My question for you tonight, for the ladies that are here, how are you measuring up? I say to you, young men, the lady you're dating, how does she's measuring up? I, I say to you, single women that's looking for a husband, how are you measuring up? The way that we're going to make America better, the way we're going to make our churches stronger, is that we start doing as you're doing, teaching. Not what the sociology books are saying, not what the psychology books are saying, but what the Bible is saying. These are the qualities of an ideal wife. We also need to teach on the qualities of an ideal husband, but tonight is the wife. And I'm challenging you and I'm challenging myself. How are we measuring up in the eyes of God? The reason marriage is declining in America at its all-time low. The reason our direct divorce rate and our deterioration of the family exists in America is because somehow about 20 years ago, we stopped teaching on the family. We stopped teaching and living it. And now we are suffering the repercussion of a failure to pass on what was passed on to us. We fail to pass on to our children and grandchildren what our parents passed on to us. And now this wonderful nation, this wonderful country of America is in trouble because our family is in the worst condition that has ever been. And I commend you. I thank you for doing what you can to pass it on to the young people here to not idolize the things that are being taught in the media, but to, be, but to idolize the things that have been taught in God's word about what makes a woman ideal for marriage. What makes a man an ideal for marriage? All of this starts with a woman in, in everybody surrendering to Jesus. Matthew 16, 24, anyone who comes after me must first deny himself. We must be willing to deny, die to self, and then obey the gospel. Thank God that we can understand the gospel. Ephesians 5, verse 17, be ye therefore not unwise, but be ye wise, understanding what the will of God is. We can know God's will. Not only what we need to do, do to be saved, we can know God's will about what's an ideal wife, what's an ideal husband. If we stay with the book, we can know it. 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that you may know. God, through his infinite wisdom, through the Holy Spirit, has given us all that we need to know. 2 Peter 1 and verse number 3. What we have to do is stay with the book. And if we can stay with the book and get others to believe in the book, then maybe it's not too late to change the course that this great nation is on. But if there's someone here tonight, God help, maybe there's someone tonight that said, I can do better as a husband or as a wife or as a Christian. That's what we're here for. We want to give you that opportunity as we together stand and sing the invitation song.
Amen, Brother Sam. Amen. You did an excellent job tonight, and we appreciate it so much and the good work that you do for the Lord's Church. And you're always welcome to come here to Vibe's Branch in Matt Menville. I want to welcome each of you to our services this evening, and we do have some visitors. We're glad that you're here. We welcome you and encourage you to come and visit with us at every opportunity that you may have. Visitation Group 1, please remember your meeting tonight in Room 1. If you're here and not have had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper and to give you your means, this has been prepared. If you make your way, your way at this time to the back of the auditorium, through the doors into, into room number one, there'd be brother in there to assist you as you continue your worship to God. I want to continue to pray for those who are sick in their daily prayers to send them cards, phone calls, whatever we can do to brighten their day. Uh, they would appreciate anything you can do to give them uh, something to cheer about each day. And we want to remember to do that. We want everyone to be careful over the holiday that we've got coming up and you're driving, wherever you're going, drive careful and that uh, will eliminate any problems and that way we can all be back together again next week. Remember our midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. this Wednesday. We'll sing this song be led in a dismissal prayer. Savior, if in your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts father for this very day in our lives we thank you father for this congregation for tony and jason and the elders and we pray father that you would be with them and help them father as they shepherd the flock here we're so thankful father for our special speaker sam jones and the wonderful lesson that he has brought to us and we know, Father, that in our lives, as we stand before you as husband and as wife, that there are fights, Father. We make a long marriage till death do you part. But there are differences of opinion, Father. We realize that. And we pray, Father, that you would always have us to look to your word to guide us through that marriage. Thank you again, Father, for Brother Sam Jones and the good lesson that he has brought to us. We pray, Father, for the military people and the police and the fire people, and we pray, Father, that you would be with them and keep them from harm's way. Father, we pray at this time as we come close to the close of this worship hour that you would be with those, Father, that are sick among us. And we pray, Father, for your healing hand be upon them. Father, and we pray that you would be with us as we 
fellowship in this ice cream social. And we pray, Father, that you would bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies to thy service. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.